Welcome. My name is Cody Thaller. I am one of our resident uh, software engineering subject matter experts. Um, and today we're going to be learning about HTML and CSS. Uh, before we get into that, a little bit about myself. Um, I have been teaching uh, web development in, uh, you know, a boot camp style uh, program for about three years now, two and a half, three years now. Um, I had uh, gone to one myself. So um, I had graduated with a bachelor's in computer engineering and felt kind of like I knew I had a good grasp on the fundamentals and the concepts, but I didn't really feel like I was too strong in terms of application. So I went to a programming bootcamp just like Kenzie Academy. Um, and I have to say that it helped me out tremendously and I've been uh, loving it ever since. Um, but today, what we're going to be learning about is HTML and CSS, which are the basic building blocks when it comes to web development. So we're going to start with HTML. What is HTML? Well, it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And what that means is it, it is a, uh, a markup language that is interpreted by the browser, and it is essentially strings of text that describe how text should appear on a web page. It uses uh, tags, which are used to define elements to tell the browser how they should look. Um, and they're, it's often paired with two other very commonly used languages, CSS and JavaScript, where CSS is made for handling the appearance uh, you know, on top of the, the content itself, how is it going to be aligned? How is it going to be um, styled? What is What are the fonts gonna look like? What's the font size, things like that. Um, and then there's also the JavaScript, which is generally used for functionality. The structure of HTML can be a little overwhelming, especially when you first start. Um, we see these, angle brackets, these greater than and less than symbols with some text inside of them, and then there's more text inside of that, and it can get a little bit overwhelming. But the easiest way to kind of try and wrap your head around why we need this pattern is if you think about it, this text is being transmitted in all of these network calls, right? You go to a website and you send a request and get this response back, and this text needs to be interpreted by the browser. So you'll notice this pattern here, of, um, I guess I can't really draw in here, but you'll notice that, for example, the HTML tag on the second line, there's a corresponding what we call closing tag down at the bottom. The idea here is the browser will be able to read the first opening tag and then keep that in mind and say, okay, so what, what all is included, is encompassed within this one type of element? Right, um, and so let's break down the, the general structure that every HTML file should have. We have this doc type HTML that informs the browser which version of HTML is gonna be used in the document. There are, technically we are currently on HTML5. Um, you can use things other than HTML. There's also XML that looks very similar to HTML, um, but the browser needs to know what kind of content it's getting. And so that's what this doc type HTML uh, indicates. Then you notice we have the HTML tag itself. And that's basically telling the browser, this is the start of the actual content of this web page. And the browser knows when it finishes reading through and displaying all the content, when it reaches that closing HTML tag on the, on the, on the bottom. We call this the root element or the top level element because it's, it's what contains everything that makes up a given website. Even if you're bringing in other languages like CSS and JavaScript, it's all technically happening within the confines of this HTML element, this web page, basically. The head element contains information that kind of describes the web page. Um, one thing that we see in here is the title. So the best way to describe that is you go to a website on your browser and you have a bunch of different tabs open. 
the name that shows up on the tab is the title of your HTML file. So the head contains that kind of information, information that is necessary for properly um, displaying and rendering the page, but that you, a user's probably not gonna see directly within that viewport when they pull up their browser. Um, other information that you'll see in the head is um, bringing in CSS styling or bringing in JavaScript files. Um, it can be used to describe and explain what, you know, what, what language is this, um, what language are we using within this? What kind of character set are we using within this HTML page? So that the browser can kind of make those decisions in how to display it. Um, and then the body represents the content itself of an HTML document. And as budding web developers, this is what you'll be using. And this is where you'll be writing the majority of your HTML code if you end up creating HTML files. So this is the overall structure, but if we're gonna be working within the body a lot, what kind of content goes in there? More tags, right? We looked at a bunch of different tags. That's the, that's the name of the game here when it comes to HTML. It's tags on tags on tags, and then there's some content thrown in. On this slide, we're going over some of the, 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 the very basics. Later on in the demo, we'll probably do a little bit, you know, maybe something a little bit more complex and we'll, we'll, we'll show it in action. But, you know, we need to kind of see what kind of tags, what, what kinds of things are we going to expect? And what, what should we expect to see when looking at HTML files? Arguably the most common or one of the most common uh, HTML tags is this P tag inside of the angle brackets is a P, and then there is a, an opening and closing tag, just like we saw with the HTML and the head and the body, there is a, a, an opening tag and a closing tag. With a paragraph tag, you put all of the text for that paragraph within those two tags. So you have the tag itself, there's an example in the middle that says uh, the P tag with this defines a paragraph and then the closing tag, and the resulting text that shows up on the page will just be the text that's within those tags. There's a strong tag, which is made, it's used for bolding text, right? Not, you don't always wanna just look at a giant wall of text that's exactly the same thickness. It's hard to kind of see what pops out if you're trying to skim through and, and, and figure out what portions of this you should really focus on. Having bold or italicized or underlined text really helps out with that, right? And so we have tags for bolding text, that's strong tag. Any text within other text, it could be inside of another paragraph tag. Any text inside of that strong tag is going to be bolder than the surrounding text. Any text inside of an EM tag, which is short for emphasis or emphasize, is going to italicize the text. If, it, if we have the U tag, that text inside of there is going to be underlined. And then it's possible that somewhere you need to have a line break and we have a BR tag, which is a, a break. Now the BR tag is a little bit different. All of these other tags that we've been dealing with have an opening and a closing tag, right? But the difference here is that with something like a line break, and there's, there are a lot of tags that only contain one tag, there's not an opening and a close. The way to kind of understand and, and, and predict which tag type is going to need a closing tag versus which is not is what needs content inside of it. A line break doesn't. The whole purpose of a line break is to just create empty space between a line above and a line below. So in this example, we have defines A with a line break, new line. And then in the resulting text, Notice how there is now a new line after defines A. And then we have something a little bit more complex. This is, this is our first step into looking at, you know, combining multiple tags together, a bullet point list. UL is short for unordered list. And LI is short for list item. 
There's also an OL, which is short for ordered list. And the difference between the unordered and ordered list is that an unordered list by default has bullet points. The ordered list by default is numbered one, two, three, four, five, etc. And while previously we've just been dealing with these tags that have text inside of them, now we see that we have an unordered list tag followed by three sets of list item tags and then a closing unordered list tag. The structure here is how the browser is able to tell which line of text is going to need the, the bullet point, right? We'll see when we do our little demonstration that it's not as simple as just aligning the text on the page as we see it to make it appear that way in the browser. There are a lot of internal styling choices being made by the browser itself based on the HTML elements. And so for each bullet point that you want to, to appear within a list, you need to have each one be its own LI tag, its own list item tag. And the, these are just some of the examples. There are so many. I would argue that most developers couldn't tell you every single one of them. I will tell you right away, I don't know all of them. There's tons of documentation out there to, to learn about them, but there are so many, and some of them are such niche situations. Um, like there's a code tag that's just used for displaying text to look like code. Like that's a, that's why, you know, why they dedicated resources to such a specific thing. And that's the kind of stuff that you're gonna see within HTML. There's all kinds of different tags. So don't think that this is everything that you're gonna see because there's lots more out there, but this general pattern is incredibly common and you're going to see it all throughout whenever you build out HTML pages. Now, these tags can also contain what are called attributes and an HTML attribute will be used to provide a little bit of ex uh, a little bit of extra information about something regarding the tag. And the reason that I'm using such vague terminology is that it really depends on the type of tag, on what the attribute actually is. Um, and so there's not, you know, it's, it's quite literally just information attributes about an element. Some of the ones that we're gonna end up looking at include href, which is short for hyperlink reference. Think of this as, um, you know, you go to a website and you see a line of text that's that got that blue text color and the underline that you can click on it and then it'll navigate you to another page. Within that element, there is an href that says what website should the browser go to when a user clicks on this. Um, there's IDs which are used to uniquely identify a given element. Um, a lot of the use cases for IDs revolve around JavaScript because you need to be able to target one specific element and the ID is the easiest way to do that. But it can be used within the next topic that we're gonna talk about. Um, and so are classes. Classes are a, they're attributes that allow us to classify elements in a given way. Predominantly, we use it to classify it for use in styling our web page, which is the next topic. CSS. What is CSS? Well, CSS stands for cascading style sheets. When you go to a website, generally you see some flashes of color, the 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 font is generally not just like Times New Roman. Um, you have elements that are aligned next to each other. Maybe there's a table on the page and it, it looks really pretty. You got these buttons that have, you know, nice color to them um, and things like that. That's all done with CSS. Basic HTML will align things to a very limited extent but CSS saves us and allows us to control exactly where on the page things should appear. Um, you know, what color should fonts be? How large or small should an element appear on the page? Should we have some border, some shadow behind it? Should the borders be rounded? Should they be square? Should we rotate an element? You can control so much when it comes to these, these elements by using CSS. Now, the reason why on the previous page we talked about ID and class as tying into CSS is because we're going to be using them a lot. Um, we'll see in one of the later slides exactly how, 
But let's take a look at this page here. This is what a website might theoretically look like with no CSS. And when I say no CSS, I mean, we're basically entrusting the browser to shape what this page looks like. Um, a fairly common misconception when developers are new is that all web pages look exactly the same regardless of the browser. That's absolutely not the case. Go talk to any seasoned developer and ask them what they think about Internet Explorer and you're in for the diatribe of a lifetime because no developer likes building their pages to make sure it works with Internet Explorer. Um, but this is what it looks like. And I like to say that this looks kind of like a Microsoft Word document. Right, it's just Times New Roman, plain black text against a white background. But with CSS, this is, notice everything that's on this page is the same thing that's on this page. You have the Kenzie Academy logo, my to-do list, a little input to be able to type some text and a button to add to a task, and then a list with some text. Bring CSS into the mix, this looks a lot better. You know, this is a very limited amount of CSS and it looks infinitely more professional than this Microsoft Word document or Craigslist, you know? CSS gives us the ability to do this by using these selectors. Now, when we brought up classes and IDs before, those attributes can be used as selectors within our CSS. The idea of a selector within CSS is we need to select which elements we need to apply some kind of styling to. So let's look at some of the common ones. The most, the, the least specific HTML or CSS selectors are going to be the tags themselves. Notice in this instance, it's just a, the letter P followed by an open set of curly braces with a line of text inside of those curly braces. The P is the selector. This means that all text within, or all contents of anything that is inside of a paragraph tag will be given whatever CSS properties and values are within those curly braces. So in this situation, every single paragraph tag will have its text given a color of blue. But we can get a little bit more specific. Maybe we don't want every single text or every single paragraph to have the same exact text color, right? Maybe we want to have some paragraphs be uh, get blue text, some paragraphs should have red text. Um, maybe some of them should just have black text. This is where these class names come in. We can define classes with whatever name we want as long as it's preceded by a period. So in the second, second example, there is a class that we'll be using called foo. And any contents inside of there will be given a color of red. Now, when I say a color of red, we need to remember that HTML is hypertext markup language. And so this basic color it's not talking about a background color. It's not talking about the color of the border or anything. Color itself is a property that defines the text color of all contents inside of that foo class. Now you'll see in the next example, the ID looks very similar. The difference being instead of a pound sign or instead of a period, it uses the pound sign or the hashtag or, you know, technically it's called an optothorpe, but nobody knows that. The pound sign in front of the, the name indicates that the selector is an ID rather than a class. So what's the difference between a class and an ID? Well, a, according to best practice standards, an ID should only appear on a web page a single time. It is supposed to be a unique identifier. And while most browsers will actually make it look the way that you want it to, if you have an ID show up multiple times, it is one of the few times where I will tell you as a developer, that's wrong, don't do that. A class on the other hand is a class of elements, a classification. You can have a ton of different elements use the same class. So there's that difference there between a class and an ID. It's, it's the specificity. 
And then you can combine selectors. So in this example down here, p.foo pound sign bar means that it's going to apply the text color of yellow to every uh, to the item with an ID of bar that's inside of an element with a class of foo that's inside of an element with a uh, oh that's that's a paragraph. Um, I'm sorry. I, I if if there were spaces, that's how it would be. So this is this is actually the paragraph with a class of foo and an ID of bar. That is what's going to have the color of yellow. There are ways that you can combine these selectors to say I only want to target the uh, list item that's inside of uh, an unordered list with a class of fungus that's, you know, the third child element of the paragraph with an ID of elephant. You can combine these uh, selectors with tons of different combinations and, you know, infinite combinations. So that's all nice conceptually. But I think it's demo time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build out something really basic. And we'll take a look at some HTML and then add some CSS to clean it up and make it look a little bit nicer. Okay. Okay. So what I have here is I'm using a program called Visual Studio Code, um, and it is a totally free resource. Uh, if you're ever interested in getting into coding, highly recommend it. It's totally free. It's easy to customize. It looks great. Um, and I have two files that I've set up for this demonstration. I have index.html, and this is where we're going to create our HTML code and then a style.css file that is that we'll use to create the styling for a web page. Now, a lot of this should, you know, probably looks a little familiar. A few slides back, we talked about the doc type HTML, the HTML tag, opening and closing tag. There's the head that has all kinds of information, right? There weren't so many examples in that in that uh, slide, but here we see that we have uh, metadata about which character set to use, metadata about HTTP equivalency, and um, you know you can basically dictate, given a certain browser, what kind of rule set should be used. And right here, you'll see this is all boilerplate. I didn't type this out myself. I used a uh, boilerplate snippet that's built into Visual Studio Code, and I love it because it's even saying. If this is being loaded into Internet Explorer, please don't use Internet Explorer. Use uh, rules. Use the edge rules. Nobody likes Internet Explorer. Um, so we've got some metadata in here, but in the body is where we're going to add everything. So I want to talk about arguably the most important element that your website can have. You've probably heard the term search engine optimization somewhere before. Either you're in business and you need to worry about SEO, search engine optimization, to make sure that your product is being, um, you know, or your business is, vis you know, visible on the internet. But there is another type of tag that we didn't talk about, and it is a heading tag. And the heading tag, there can be a bunch of different levels of it, but there's one of them that's really important, kind of similar to an ID. There should only ever be one h1 tag on a given web page a single page and this h1 is is going to be used for things like making sure that the right information is displayed on google google isn't a bunch of people that are sitting around going to website website to website and taking notes about what should be written on the page when you go to google.com and search for something it uses what are called web crawlers and these web crawlers will go to you know, or I, I say go to, but really what they're doing is they're making requests and getting HTML back and parsing through the HTML to see what is the information that is probably most important. Well, the most important information arguably is going to be the primary heading. It's the title of your website. What is this page? So I'm going to call this Cody's Cool Coding. I can't think of something else with a C to toss in here. So I'll call it a demo. Cody's cool coding demo. 
is going to be my primary heading, is my biggest title. It is telling you exactly what's going on on this website. How do we look at this? Well, there's a really cool extension that we can use uh, called Live Server, and I'm just gonna use that. Um, ooh, Cody's Cool Coding Creation, yes. Love it. Cody's Cool Coding Creation, perfect. Um, I can use this live, uh, live server and it will open up my web page in my browser. Or if you don't feel that fancy, you can always just copy the path of the file itself, paste it in the browser. That works too. But I'm gonna be using the live server because live server is great as I make changes to my HTML, it'll be reflected here. So we've got our primary heading. Maybe I wanna have a subheading, an H2 tag. That's gonna say, I, I'm not gonna alliterate for this one. Thanks for joining me or joining us to learn about HTML and CSS. And if I save it, go back over, notice it's a little bit smaller. Now, a lot of people, a lot of developers, especially beginners, are gonna look at these two and say, oh, so the difference is one is bigger and bolder. But we're gonna see when we get into CSS that I can theoretically make it so that the H1 tag doesn't even show up on the page. And there are plenty of websites where you'll see that. They don't necessarily wanna have just a giant big bold thing, but they want that search engine optimization, so they'll hide it somewhere. So we've got heading tags, and fun fact, these go all the way down to H5, H6. Uh, so let's do H3, less important, four, five, six. And you see it just gets less and less important, right? Visually, the easiest way to tell how important something is is how big is this thing showing up on my page? Um, so you can have heading tags all the way down to H6, but we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna be building out like a little footer with some tiny little text that you have to zoom in to see. No, we're not gonna do that. What about pictures? We've been talking about text and nothing but text. But we all know we've been to websites that we can go find pictures on, right? Instagram wouldn't be a thing. How could Instagram exist if, they, if it's just text? Well, the key is that HTML is hypertext, which stands for text, or well, it means text that describes text. So we have an image tag, IMG, and it doesn't have a closing tag. Because what text goes inside of an image? Well, nothing. A picture is worth the text, right? It's worth a thousand words. This is where the attributes will start to come into play here. We talked a little bit about them and said that it's, it's extra information about an element. An image tag has two major attributes that you should have on every single image that you ever create. One of them is a source. And this source is, where is this image coming from? I can have an image saved locally within this folder or I can go out onto the internet and look for one. So I'm gonna look up a picture of a fluffy bunny. Those are some adorable little bunnies. Wait a second. I just saw it a second ago, go back. What is happening there? I don't know, but we're using that one. We right click on the picture and go down to copy image address and paste that in as the source. Notice that this looks almost looks like another website, right? HTTPS colon slash slash I dot pin IMG dot com, blah, 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 blah. Easter bunny, oh, that doesn't look like an Easter bunny to me, but whatever, dot JPG. This source isn't even on my computer. This image's source is going to be from somewhere else on the internet. And that's totally fine. Now, the second attribute that we always want on our image tags is used mainly for accessibility purposes. 
if you become a developer, you're going to find that accessibility is a huge deal. Believe it or not, not everybody that uses the internet can actually see what's showing up on the page, or maybe they have um, dyslexia and they use a screen reader, right? Plenty of people have some kind of visual impairment and they're not necessarily able to experience a web page the way that you or I might. You know, it's quite possible that somebody here might be using a screen reader for one thing or another. There is an attribute called alt, and it stands for just alternate. A lot of people think that maybe we should be putting another image URL here as kind of a backup, but really what this is supposed to be used for is to describe the picture. In case the image breaks, it will instead show a little broken image icon and the text that we put inside of this alt. But in my opinion, and more importantly, I think, this should describe the picture because if somebody's using something like a screen reader, what do you think is gonna be more descriptive to somebody that maybe can't see what's on the screen but can hear it read out to them? Reading out this long URL? or reading out text that says an oddly terrifying bunny. Probably the second one. So every image tag that you create should have an alt that describes what the picture is for accessibility purposes. And so let's go take a look at what this looks like. Now we have this big bunny. And yes, it is indeed not quite as scary as that Easter bunny from Animal Crossing. That thing haunts me. So we've got Cody's Cool Code and Creation. Thanks for joining us to learn about HTML and CSS. And we've got this bunny picture. What else can we toss in here? There's a very common tag called a div. A div is a division. Think of div as almost like a container that's just going to hold other HTML. Sometimes you just want to classify a group of HTML elements as being part of the same content. Think of it as just kind of like a blank slate, a blank basket for you to put whatever you want in there. Maybe these Easter eggs that the terrifying Animal Crossing Easter Bunny is forcing you to pick up. Inside of the div, we can put anything. We can put text in there. We can put multiple HTML elements. We can put, well, I mean, that's really all there is to do, right? This, we're dealing with HTML or either writing text or making more HTML elements. In this division, let's do something like, uh, we'll create a, uh, a title with an unordered list. So I'll put an H4 tag. I'm gonna skip the H3, because why not? Um, things I forgot to do today. And let's make one of these lists. An unordered list, is what we were talking about before. We also talked about ordered list. We're gonna use an unordered list because I don't wanna prioritize the things that I forgot to do today. UL. Now, I talked about how we needed to put these elements inside of this other element before because I can't just put some text there in, you know, with each thing on a new line and expect the browser to understand it. What we have to remember is that as the browser receives this HTML, it's actually getting it as one really, really long string. It's not getting, oh, this is tabbed in, this element is tabbed in. It doesn't get any of that when it actually receives the HTML. So if I said that I forgot to go grocery shopping and that I forgot to tie my shoes, but who's wearing shoes working from home, right? I see this and I say, oh, each one is gonna be its own element, right? This is on one line and this is on another line. But if we go look, no, it just says go grocery shopping, tie my shoes on one line. Why did I jump to H4? I just didn't feel like having an H3. You know, there's, I don't feel like this is that much, you know, I, I don't feel like it's, it's just a little bit less important than the H2. There's. At, basically, once you get past the H1 and maybe the H2, it's a lot of free for all when it comes to which heading tags you're gonna use. Obviously, the higher level of importance should be the lower number, um, but for something like this, eh. but I could make it an H3 if I want to. 
So I need to wrap these two items into list item tags. And then let's see, uh, I forgot to watch the new episode of Obi-Wan Kenobi. I didn't really forget, I just had to work. But now we can go look and we see that we have this list underneath things I forgot to do today. And now I'm gonna create another division here. I'm gonna create another div and call it things I remembered to do today. And in this list, I'll say, give a lecture on advanced routing in React. I remembered to uh, post the lecture recording, and I remembered to check for newly submitted assignments. And there we go, we have more text with another, another list. But this all looks nice. Let's add some pizzazz to this. Let's make it look a little bit nicer. I want these two elements to kind of be sitting side by side, right? I want that to be kind of, you know, you go to a website and you have that kind of top navigation that's got some important information there. I wanna have like a heading and a subheading on there. I can create a new element and put them inside there, but I wanna talk about CSS. Let's take a look at how we can do this. I want to select my H1 tag and my H2 tag, and I wanna tell it, hey, sit next to each other, go side by side. In my style.css, I can select my H1, and if I separate with a comma, any rules that I put inside of these curly braces, will be applied to both the H1 tag and the H2 tag. Now, something to keep in mind here is that if I ended up building out this application even more, and I had multiple H2 tags or multiple H1 tags, this would be applied to every single one of them. But we're gonna start simple here and just use the tag itself. I can choose how to display this element, and I'm going to use a property value called inline block. By default, most HTML elements are given a default display property of block, which means block off the entire width of the screen or with you know the entire width of where this element exists. And don't let anything go next to it. But display inline block says, okay, you can have these two sit side by side. And the difference between something like display inline versus inline block is that with inline block, I could then go give the H1 and H2 their own height. Um, I could give them some properties that you necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily be able to give to text itself. So I've got my H1 and my H2 being displayed as inline block, and we see that it's not showing up. Well, the reason for that is I haven't linked the two yet. In my head element, I need to create a link to my style sheet and it's sitting at style.css. So now if I save that, now we see that Cody's cool coding creation and thanks for joining us to learn about HTML and CSS are sitting right next to each other. I'm also going to give, you know what? I am gonna give these, put these in their own uh, div. Let's call it a, a header. And why do I wanna do that? Because I wanna show another way that we can get things side by side um, and a little bit more organized. In my header tag, I'm going to give a display property of flex. Oops, wrong browser. And now we see that they're side by side. Display flex is really, forgive me for this, flexible. 
I can choose how to justify the content. Maybe I want to space it evenly. I can choose how I want to align the items in the direction, you know, in, in, in perpendicular direction to where they're going, right? There, it's going from left to right. So align item center will center them vertically. There we go. Maybe I want to take that image and I want to make it a little bit smaller. And I'm going to give it a class or I'm going to give it an ID because it's there's only one of them of scary bunny. And I will target that with a pound sign because that I'm selecting it by its ID scary dash bunny. We'll give it a width of I don't know, 150 pixels. There we go. It's smaller and less terrifying. But now I want to get these two to sit side by side and maybe give them a little bit of a, a border, some background, make it look a little bit nicer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give those two divs a class of um, list box. It's going to be the box that contains my list. Uh, list box. We'll have a width of, we'll say 350 pixels. And it will have a background color of light blue. We'll do a border of dark blue. Uh, and we'll say that it's gonna be three pixels and it's gonna be a solid line. Three pixels, solid dark blue. Border radius, 25 pixels. Eh, let's go 15 pixels. Um, and let's add some padding so that the inner contents are pushed in just a little bit from the outsides and they're not creeping up on the side of the actual uh, box and we'll give it 15 pixels of padding. And now we see that they're in their little box but they're on top of each other. So I'm also gonna give them a display property of inline block. And I'm also gonna give it some margin to force it to stay a little bit away from each other. Margin is gonna be 25 pixels, which means that nothing can come within 25 pixels of it. The image does not have any margin. This box has 25 pixels of margin, which means that the bunny image is only gonna be 25 pixels away from it. But in between these two will be 50 pixels because it's 25 pixels for this one, 25 for this one. So we went pretty quickly there, but the whole idea of CSS is you are going to select the element that you want to style. And then, you know, based on what you're trying to do, pick a property and give it a value. Now, obviously I've been doing this for a little while, so I know what these properties and values should be. If you would like a great resource for a little bit more, feel free to check out w3schools.com. It is a fantastic free resource. It is basically the school of the internet. It tells you all about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you'll get tons and tons of information on what kinds of elements you can create, what kinds of CSS properties you can use, things like that. Now we are at the end of our time here, so I am gonna wrap this up and we will uh, just very briefly Look at the harmony of HTML and CSS, right? We had the HTML that has all of the content itself and what, sh what should appear on the screen, whereas the CSS is essentially determining how it should appear on the screen. And now I'm gonna pass it on back over to Daniel to wrap up and close out the wonderful evening. Um, first of all, thank you so much for that uh, presentation, Cody. That was amazing. That that sparked my interest to to go look into it. I think I'm going to go look at our uh, Kenzie free course so I can get some practice doing that. Um, what I'm going to do now is start um, making everyone a panelist. You can accept or you can decline. And 
if you'd like, you can go ahead and ask your questions directly. I do recommend that you raise your hand so we can have a little bit of order to this and everyone can get a chance. Um, if you have to step out, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, up front, does anyone have any questions? Let me go ahead and start getting everyone converted. Hello. Zoom toolbar. There we go. All righty. So it will start happening now. And I see some of you do have your hands raised. And so go ahead. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and ask away. I was just wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, if I could see Cody's um, HTML one last time. I just wanted to take a quick screenshot, if you didn't mind. Do remember that this is Cody's IP, and we don't want to steal his lovely bunny reminder website. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You have you have my full permission to take this, <laughs> do whatever you wish with it. Tell the world that you forgot to go grocery shopping today. <laughs> and would I be able to see index.html one last time, please? That thank is you. HTML. Do you mean the style.css? Oh, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you also be able to share, Cody, please, the program that you used? Yes to do this again, just one more time for anyone that Absolutely. might have missed it. It is called Visual Studio Code, and I will post a link to where you can go and download it. Okay. If I missed you on promoting you to panelists, go ahead and at me so that I can get you in here. Uh, it's kind of jumped around on my screen a few times, so I've, I've lost track of where I am. And do want to be mindful of everyone's time. And so if you do need to step out 100%, I do understand. Uh, I see Brianna's question. What was the resource that I mentioned at the end? W3 schools. Um, I will post that link in here as well for you. That was my I have been too. at this for hand. quite a while. And I will let you know that I use W3 schools on the regular. It is a fantastic resource, always free to use. Um, if you go to the references portion, it will show you everything, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. There's some, you know, more advanced programming things on there, um, but it's got great resources for beginners, especially. I did post my email in the chat for anyone who did not get a chance to register. And that way, if you email me directly, as soon as the project becomes available to be viewed, I will send it to you. But definitely get those emails in if you wanna have a recording of this slide. And feel free to just go on ahead and ask your questions if it's Um, if you guys don't have any questions, I certainly do. I am super curious. I see we have a we do have a question in here. Uh, Joseph Baker asks, he start I'm starting the software engineering with a backend specializ specialization. Should I still learn JavaScript? Yes, it's still a great tool to use. In fact, uh, there's a really popular stack of technologies called MERN, MongoDB, Express, React, and Node. And that is JavaScript from top to bottom. Everything on the front end is JavaScript and everything in the back end is JavaScript. So um, while JavaScript was initially created as a front end scripting language, it has evolved to be used in a lot more than just the front end. So um, definitely helpful, you know, uh, a back end developer that can hop in and help out a little bit on the front end is gonna be a lot more marketable than one that can't too. So definitely a good skill to use and learn. Gosh, I want to go program something now. <laughs> I used to be a, a professional at making, you know, flashing text scroll across my screen and all kinds of other stuff on my space. And I professional list maker over there with the little drop down box. Oof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Is there an HTML CSS course at Kenzie? Right now I'm in the, uh, the back end Java uh, class and I saw there was a front end MERN class, but is there a HTML CSS ones? I don't think there is one just for HTML and CSS, but for the full stack MERN, um, the first 12 weeks is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Oh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> I'm guessing we're not going in any particular order as far as questions, right? Ask away. OK. So um, what is the schedule going to be for students? Um, so I believe it's, it, there is a little bit of leeway in terms of, you know, based on your instructor and when they specifically schedule. Um, so I know for myself, um, with my current group of students, I pulled at the beginning of the course, what hours work best for you in terms of when you would be most, most likely be able to attend class. Um, and I use that to kind of dictate what time I will be doing lectures each week. Um, but it's broken down into a few different sections and that's consistent. There's a weekly kickoff each week, each week where your instructor will go into detail about what you're going to be learning through the week on a kind of a higher level, maybe do a little brief demonstration of one of those, one or two of those topics. Um, and then you'll have two topic sessions where two of the major topics that you're going to be using throughout the week, you'll, you'll have an hour to hour and a half lecture on it, uh, with your instructor. Um, and then after that, there are also Q&A sessions throughout the, the week where you have the opportunity to um, interact with your instructor and your facilitators, your coaches, and ask questions, get those answered. Um, and then there are also study halls that, you know, some of them are um, staff led where, you know, it's kind of similar to the Q&A where you're able to go in and ask questions and just kind of hang out and work. Um, but I do know we are working on releasing a feature here pretty soon where you're going to be able to see if any other students are hanging out in a Zoom room working on things and you can kind of hop in. So um, it's a <laughs> little open-ended. Um, oh, I see. But, you know, it's... So do you, do you think that's more advantageous than having a set schedule when it comes down to programming? So it really does depend. I mean... This is, this is a course where there's, um, you know, we call it semi-synchronous. Um, I've, I have worked with both synchronous and semi-synchronous where, you know, previously I was teaching where students had to be sitting there in front of me essentially in Zoom eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is, you know, we have lecture a few times a week. And of course, if you can't make the lecture, it is recorded and posted, so you'll still see it. Um, but it's, you know, whether it's advantageous or not really, I think, depends on your own personal study style, right? If you are the kind of person that um, needs a lot of handholding and face-to-face -face interaction constantly, it might be a little bit harder. Um, but if you're, you're the kind of person that likes to work out problems on your own and then Kind of gather your questions so that you're not constantly saying wait i have another question wait i have another question um then this is definitely more advantageous and i would say for actually learning the material that's probably the better way because if you just ask a question every time that you run into a problem you're just learning how to ask something rather than trying to problem solve it yourself so i think it encourages more of that um problem solving because that's what engineering is ultimately is problem solving and i would like to add to that if i may um you are certainly welcome and encouraged encouraged to plan out a schedule that works for you for each week and that way if consistency is important to you then you can have that consistency i am a creature of habit my entire life is even on my google calendar i'm that kind of person and so i totally understand that from your perspective the goal of this selectively synchronous style is that it's there to help serve people as well that aren't so much served by that traditional education route and so for people who work during the day nine to five who can't attend a class every day at a you know those hours or you know whatnot it's it's there to offer that flexibility for those who need it as well as consistently for those who need that as well and so those the, the schedule is there 
And if you need consistency, you can, you know, adhere to that. You can always go to the Sunday one o'clock class and um, whatnot, where you can always go to the Monday four o'clock topic session if that works for you. But, you know, sometimes things come up or things need to be changed. And so that is where the benefit of this selectively synchronous program comes in, as well as the fact that they're recorded so you can view it at a later date. So if you have to miss a whole day, you can view it later. Or if you just need some extra review, you have it there too as well. So do you think this program is good for um, beginners? Um, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't know if I quite heard you. Um, no, I think I, you said, is it for beginners? Do you? Okay, because after after describing the schedule and the learning format, do you think that it's a good format for beginners, uh, students who have absolutely like no experience and probably need a little bit more hand-holding? I would say for, for me, from, from my experience, and I'll also let um, Cody touch on that as well, because he might have a little bit better um, understanding of that. Yeah. Um, but our program is basically designed to take those with zero experience. Hello. To hero. Um, hello, who, whoever was um, speaking. Um, I, I promise I will get to you in just a moment. I just want to go ahead and answer Jocelyn's question really quick. Hey, can you see me? I'm here, Joseph Hamilton. Can you see me? Hi, hi Joseph. How are you doing? Because it's... Is, is, is there any classes in the Ken's Academy, Academy here, like in the new classes here? Can one, or you, you know about me, Ken's Academy, some Amazon from from last year. Oh, hi. Um, will you just hold on one moment for me, please? I do want to go ahead and get to Jocelyn's question because I do want to be respectful of everybody's time here today. And I'm not sure how long she has left here to hang out with us. And so I do promise we will get right with you, okay? And if you need to, you're also welcome to send me a message directly and I can answer it there as well. Okay. So, so, so send your message on no talking, no voice talk, no speech. You you can, um, but I do want to get to people in the order that they ask their questions. And so um, if we just want to be respectful of everyone else that's in this room, I would greatly appreciate that, okay? But yeah. I do promise, Joseph, I do see you and you are valid and we will get to you, okay? All right, thank you. Um, so, um, Jocelyn, yes, this program is designed to take those from zero experience all the way to hero, how I like to position it. But it is something to consider whenever you're looking at our programs, if this is gonna be the right fit for you. Um, some people do flourish better in that traditional um, education environment, like what you would receive at a four-year program. Um, now to address the whole handholding issue, that's not to say that we're leaving you in the dark. Um, we are a community here and you will have a lot of support from your instructors, peers and co um, the coaches. Um, but definitely it just really depends on, on you, um, so to speak. I, I prefer, personally found that for myself, I didn't like the traditional route because um, I couldn't attend certain classes because of work. And even when I did online programming or online classes, it would say, you know, sign in for a test at 2 p.m. And then I couldn't make it at 2 p.m. And then I'd miss the test and I couldn't do it earlier or after on my time. And so I, what I like about this program is that, you know, within your schedule, you can customize it on a plan that works best for you. And you'll also have a success advisor to help you with that. And um, there are just those weekly due dates that need to be met. So I'll also pass to Cody to um, see what else he can offer to that. But it's a great question, Jocelyn, and it's important to consider um, when choosing a program. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, I, I've seen the whole range, uh, you know, I, I got my degree at a traditional four-year university. Um, so I got that, you know, you're going to have your hour lecture twice a week, and then you're just kind of left in the dark. And then the programming boot camp that I went to was an intensive full-time, you know, 40 hours in class a week on top of the additional time that you're supposed to be working on the, on the activities and everything. So I've seen like the, you know, in person every step of the way. I've seen the, you know, kind of little bit more hands off. And, you know, this is a really good kind of hybrid of the two. Um, because even though, yes, the, the, the quote unquote sessions are, you know, four or five times a week or whatever it is, you are able to, you're still, you know, us instructors and you have coaches and facilitators, we're still here, even when we're not necessarily in class with you. So you're still able to post questions. Um, one of the one of the huge things that I always encourage students to do is use each other. You are all 
training to be developers together. And when you get, you know, when you cross that threshold and become developers professionally, your number one resource are your coworkers, right? So working with other students, being able to ask questions to your coaches and, um, and facilitators and your subject matter expert, uh, your sub subject matter experts, that's all really important. And so, you know, we, we give plenty of opportunity to do all of that. So I, I'd say as a short answer, yes, I think it's a fantastic place for total beginners because one thing that I didn't like about the, the traditional college experience was the only focus was on conceptual. You didn't get the environment in any way, shape or form being put in a group with your fellow students where they're going through the same thing and getting the assignments and, you know, getting feedback on those assignments on a regular basis, it much more mimics the professional environment. And that's, that's a huge portion of being a developer. Being a developer is a lot more than write me an app, write me a, a hello world program. It's about collaboration and working together to solve problems. That's what, that's, you know, how we, how the, how the course is built basically. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your question, Jocelyn. Okay. I'm not telling you, Kate, because you're not a good girl. Okay. And so um, I believe Joseph had his hand up first, and then I'm not sure who was next, Travis or. Oh, we have two Josephs. So Joseph with the PH, I saw your hand first, and then I'm not sure between Travis and Joseph F who is next so go ahead joseph please you guys can hear me yes sir because i i, I want i want to see if we can repair the jobs here because all they, all they introduced with the kenzie i can i can academy is some um, was working from amazon last year um joseph hamilton please hang tight for a second uh joseph baker is asking his question and then we'll get to you after I'm Joseph uh, Hamilton. Yes, I know. Joseph Hamilton, please, I'm going to I'm gonna mute you. It's Joseph Baker's turn. If you'd like, feel free to post to type your question and we can try and get to it. Um, but we're trying to take the questions in the order that they are coming in. All right, uh, Joseph Baker, go for it. You guys think it's okay to just start learning a little bit on free code camp? Would you guys recommend? Um, I haven't used free code camp myself, but I do know that it is successful. I know it's, you know, it's a big thing. Um, yeah. you know, honestly, I'd say that if you're interested in it, there is no wrong way to start learning really, you know, start, you, you do your reading, try and throw some code together, things like that. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing is getting into it, how you want to get into it. So, um, but I do know free code, free code camp is, you know, used by a lot of people so yeah okay appreciate you mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna take uh just a few more questions because i do want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time tonight here including cody and myself and so um uh, joseph hamilton would you like to go ahead and uh, um send me your question i was having trouble hearing you the the volume was having some issues for me Yes, um, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here now because I'm, I, I, I want to take, I'm taking a job with data analysis, and oh. that's the first time I, I, I was introduced to Ken's Academy here. It's, it's on Amazon from a thing we, we, we work with our Amazon last year. Like okay. I'm in New York City, and I, I, I work at Amazon a, a fulfillment center in New York City or in Staten Island. I'm in even New York State. Um, Yes, I I live in Brooklyn, New York, New York oh, cool. City, and I and, and I work in I had work in Staten Island, another another New York City borough. Okay. Yes. And so, if I'm understanding correctly, um, this we aren't particularly um, this isn't an uh, interview or job seeking, uh, course or webinar. Um, I would recommend you know checking out the um website um to look for employment opportunities um what this is for though is to go like, I'm, 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 I'm certain for like data analysis it's your data um data. yeah as of right now we don't have a data analysis course we offer a 
software engineering course that specializes in backend Java. We have a full stack web development course that focuses on the MERN stack and JavaScript. So doing um, both front end and back end. And then we have the user experience web development program that focuses on the front end entirely. Those are our Kenzie Academy courses. We do have Amazon career choice courses. Currently, as of this point, we are not accepting students. We don't have anything open for enrollment until 2023. And so if you are interested in the career choice- Which, program, month, which month of the year? Which month of the year in 2023? January? Uh, around then, yes. Um, what I'll ask of you is if you can send me an email, I'm going to put my email in the chat. And that way I can keep a note of uh, your file. And that way I can reach out to you when something does become available. And if you do have any other questions, I'm also happy to go over them through email. And if you need to make a call, I can also send you a meeting link. We can schedule a call to talk as well. How does that sound? Yeah, because I, 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 I must send, it, send you an email, send you an email about is, is there is there any jobs here? Currently we are not, um, like as far as you know, the department that I deal with, I'm an admissions counselor at Kenzie Academy, and so what I do is you know guide you through that admissions process. So I'm not aware of the current hiring opportunities. What I can do though, when you email me, is by the time um, you reach out, I'll have an answer for you to get you connected with a team that might be able to show you where job opportunities are and where our public postings are. Thank you, Joseph Baker. You have a wonderful day. And thank you, uh, Joseph Hamilton. I hope I was able to answer your question. I'm gonna go ahead and move over to Travis so I can make sure we um, get Travis and Nyla in. Hi, my question is real quick. My original goal is software shipping architect. Where would you suggest I proceed after my backend Java? Because I'm enrolled for July 26th. Is that one for you, Cody? Is that I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Okay, so my goal, mm -hmm. I enrolled, I start on July 26th. But okay. my goal is to reach a software system architect. I want to, I'm going to go for a master's eventually. Okay. Like, I mean this for a long run. So where would you suggest a side study besides this back end course? Do you have something that was um, more like just the I don't, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, a, a systems architecture guy myself. Um I would, um, you know, I know, I know that the, 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 the Java software engineering course does get into AWS. It's Amazon web services. Um, yeah. and so you're, you are going to get into that. Um, but you know, I, the, the, the best answer that I could give you is that, you know, even if, even if the topic of study is not directly related to a given field, if you're right. learning code and you're learning logic, that makes anything, any other engineer, you know, software engineering related um, field significantly easier to pick up and understand. Um, so I, you know, I don't have like a, a great answer for you just because I'm not, you know, I'm not that deep into the whole systems architecture thing myself. Um, I do but, know to be become an architect, you have to take back end, front end, and yeah. uh, advanced computer link. So, okay, well, I mean that you know front end, back end. That's that's full stack software engineering, yeah. um, and you know that's 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 handled in the in the in the the MERN stack as well. So, you know, so basically just getting your hands on any kind of as much programming related content as you can is always good. Always good. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Uh, thank you so much, Travis and Nyla. I'm opening the floor to you. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I have a question. I've been in a book camp before for a software developer. I love this. I have some problems with Java, but 
I'm really interested in keep uh, with my um, course on learning more because actually this is my goal. And I registered for, um, I think, October. Uh, but I want to do this through Amazon card career choice uh, i don't know if, if um you you guys have this open for the um uh, amazon workers or not um hi there nyla um as far as the career choice program goes currently we are not enrolling in any programs what i recommend to you is to keep an eye out on the amazon career choice website and that will have all the information that is up to date and accurate about current programs and upcoming programs. You can also send me an email and I'm happy to make a note in my file to reach out to you should something become available soon. But yes, yes as of right yes. now, um, there are no programs available for career choice, the programs that Amazon pays for in specific. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm gonna send you my email. Um, so you can... Uh, yeah. um, Contact me if you have something, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, I have to send you through uh, in the chat. Um, so I'll post my email uh, again just to make sure that you know it's there. Um, uh -huh. Just send me an email. I I'm not going to get to anything tonight. I'm going to be honest. Once I am um, finished with this, I am leaving the office, and so. Um, I'm actually out of office tomorrow as well. Starting Monday of the following week, I'll uh -huh. start checking my emails and things like that. And so if you don't hear from me, um, I promise you, I haven't forgotten about you. Um, I'm just taking care of me and doing some self-care for the weekend. And so I'll be back in the office Monday to um, make sure I can assist you, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. And thank you all so much for your questions. Again, if you have anything else that you'd like to ask, I do recommend that you email me. I do want to let everyone go and continue on with the rest of their nights. Again, thank you so much, Cody. Um, I really appreciated that. That Honestly, it sparked my interest. I, I'm wondering if I even want to be a programmer now all of a sudden. <laughs> it was very cool to see that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everybody. Fun. Always fun. You have a wonderful day. I'm going to go ahead and close out this Zoom session. Make sure you have my email if you do need any questions. It's daniel.rivera at kenzie.academy. All right. Bye, everybody. Happy Pride.